Well, hello, comrades. It's Danky here again today with... <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm noticing little details in the background now that I didn't notice before, like the sword and the sundial and the helmet. <laughs> it's just all... It's, it's a lot to take in, ladies and gentlemen, but as you can see, we are here again with our dear friend Cathorix, the right-wing furry who um, has some questions about communism. This is my second time recording this video because the first time I made a 55 minute recording and I didn't have my mic on the whole fucking time. So hopefully this time uh, <laughs> it'll, it'll turn out. So this is take two of me having to listen to this guy's fucking asinine questions. Uh, I hate my life. Hearing people talk about communism and I'm just a little confused. I have a few questions, and these are legitimate questions, so feel free to answer them in the comments. Now, communism, according to Karl Marx, is taking all power, property, and, well, everything away from the individuals and giving it to the state. I think the hope is that it's redistributed fairly among everyone, but, well, we all know how that turns out. Alright. Alright, so already we can see we're in for, we're in for a, a fucking ride here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are going along the Yellow Brick Road, and the Emerald City is looking pretty fucking bad from here. I don't know where I was trying to go with that analogy, but anyway. You know, he says that <laughs> Karl Marx uh, describes communism as a system where everything is taken from individuals and given to the state. Um, My boy needs to actually read what Karl Marx has to say because... Socialism is when <laughs> you don't take everything from individuals, you take the means of production away from the bourgeoisie, and you give it not, you know, necessarily to the state as this sort of monolithic strange entity, but to the working class. And they form a dictatorship of the proletariat, a state built by the working class. So, you know... A little misleading here to say that communism takes everything from individuals we don't want your Game Boy we don't want your furry cartoons we don't want anything that like that we're only interested in the means of production and giving it to the working class but I don't want to talk about Marxism instead let's talk about anarcho-communism basically what people call true communism or the complete dissolution of all government the complete eradication of all classes and social statuses. Everyone is entirely equal. Everyone works to the best of their ability and in return is given what they need to survive. All right, so I mean, you say let's not talk about Marxism, let's talk about anarcho-communism because that's true communism, as you say. Um, I would challenge that statement. I challenge that statement when anarchists make it, and I'll challenge that statement when a blue dragon makes it. You know, I don't care how many magic crystals or magic potions or uh, enchanted swords you have in your cave. You know, I'll, I'll challenge you on that statement any day of the week, Buckaroonie. Uh, I would argue that the USSR, uh, China, all these countries, they are communists. They're just communist in their own special little way um i'm not going to be that kind of elitist western anarchist that says "Ooh, you know i understand better than all those idiots over there in russia and those idiots in china i understand true communism because i've read kropotkin and i've read bakunin and it's like you need to actually read marx you need to actually read lenin uh, throw that Kropotkin shit in the trash where it belongs. Doesn't actually stop. But anyway, I'll hop off my soapbox talking about anarchism because this isn't a video where I'm trying to rant about anarchism. This is a video where I'm trying to answer the Blue Dragon's questions. So, I mean, let's go on with the Blue Dragon's questions. Sounds so bad. Sounds kind of utopian, actually. But I can't help but think of just a few little problems. So if the government is basically everyone, or what we will call the collective, how would anything get accomplished? Let me explain. When you have a huge group of people, let's just say the 300 million people in America, it's very hard to accomplish much of anything without some level of organization. 
usually someone is in charge. Someone who basically oversees an operation and micromanages people to coordinate for the good of that operation. But under true communism, we don't want someone in charge. Because then those people belong to a higher social class. I think this guy is confusing communism with socialism. You know, communists... Uh, communism, of course, being the dissolution of the state, a classless, stateless, moneyless society where everyone can give according to their ability and take according to their need. That's communism. Okay, uh, Socialism is the pathway towards communism. It's a, a dictatorship of the proletariat where you have central plans, uh, a coordinated economy, a planned economy that eventually produces the abundance of... Of commodities needed uh, to to realize communism so you know you ask how does anything get accomplished by a collective well in a Soviet system the workers elect representatives to serve uh, as representatives on a regional Soviet and you know on a national scale there's even higher up Soviets like a Supreme Soviet or a central planning committee of the Supreme Soviet that would produce state plans uh, taking in input from all the other regional Soviets. So, I mean, in a Soviet system, you have a government consisting of the proletariat, by the proletariat, and for the proletariat, uh, producing economic plans. Those people are a government. That's what we're trying to do away with in the first place. But someone has to be the person to micromanage other groups of people. So a class system is inevitable because it's just the nature of groups of individuals. Okay, so, and this is also sort of a misconception a lot of anarchists have about, you know, socialism. They say the second that a worker is elected to become a representative on their Soviet, uh, their regional Soviet, that all of a sudden that worker's class interests change, that they now reflect the class interest of this new emergent... Uh, government class which you know ignoring the fact that there's no longer a distinction between the government and then who controls the means of production you know it's all the workers the workers collectively control the means of production uh, ignoring that you know it doesn't make any sense to call this new government bureaucracy a separate class because, you know, from a Marxist perspective, the division uh, between the classes has to do with the material allocation of resources in a society, uh, particularly who owns the means of production. So it's, you know, it's not like uh, the second that, you know, if the socialist revolution happened and I got elected to serve on the body of you know, the Central Planning Committee, I would suddenly abandon all of my socialist uh, leanings, all of my communist thought, and just turn into some kind of capitalist shill or a fascist. You know, you wouldn't see that. And if you did see that, you would also see me being very quickly voted out by the same body of proletarian workers who voted me in. So, you know, yeah. If no one is in charge and everyone is completely equal status, then nothing gets done because everyone would just argue about what to do all day. I mean, eventually a consensus might be reached, but every time any sort of issue came up, everyone would have to stop what they're doing and either argue about it or vote. So it's pretty much required to have someone in charge. And we don't even have to talk about big government. Let's just talk about building a house. All... Oh, yeah. One quick thing I want to get out of the way. I want to say this. I'm not a lore master. All right, I'm not learned. I, I'm learned somewhat, but I'm not fucking Michael Parenti over here. I don't have a walking encyclopedic knowledge of communism and every single communist regime that has ever existed and every single sub-branch of the communist ideology. I don't know that, dude. I, I'm not like uh, an encyclopedia over here. I'm a layman, but I'm going to do my best as a humble communist, you know, to try to answer these questions as best I can. And I, I'm really trying to take this blue dragon seriously. <laughs> you know, even though he's a fucking blue dragon conservative furry who believes in cyborg child slaves. But, you know, I'm trying to take them seriously. So on this team of house builders, one carpenter wants to use aluminum nails to fasten the joint hangers because they're cheaper and 
We have more of them. But another carpenter wants to use steel nails because they're stronger. So now everyone has to stop what they're doing and come take a vote on it. But then a consensus can't be reached and they have to try to convince each other which one to go with. And they all look up online when the issue has popped up in the past. But in some cases people have gone with steel nails and in some cases people have gone with aluminum nails. So that doesn't really Just help. get on so with it, dude. Later, they finally decide on steel nails. I don't know, five minutes pass, and the one guy complains that he can't find a hammer because Steve has all the tools over in the work area, even though Steve is on a smoke break and not even using them. But then Steve comes back and is like, I'm not going to put my tools back in the toolbox every time it takes a few minutes to smoke a cigarette, because then I just have to go get them again, and it's way fast. <sighs> Jesus Christ. This, uh, this analogy is going off the rails, ladies and gentlemen. If I just have them all there when I come back. So then everyone has to stop working again and come and vote on if you should put your tools back in the toolbox when you go on break. And that takes like another two hours. But all of this could be solved if we just had a head carpenter who was like, okay, we're just going to use steel nails today and also put your tools away when you go on break. So my point is, for things to go smoothly, you need to have people in charge. I mean, that's how a Soviet system works. Um, on a local scale... The workers vote to organize councils or soviets as it, it's called in russian to oversee their various workplaces on a regional scale there's regional soviets and on a national scale there's a you know centralized national soviet so i mean there's nothing in communism that says that there can't be individual people like put in charge of certain positions or have certain positions of authority no, as long as that authority is derived from the people, I don't see the problem. And then depending on the scale of the project, you need people in charge of those people. And you probably need some kind of committee or something to make sure everyone is doing what they're supposed to do. Almost like a Soviet. Well, that's pretty much just a government. And even if each person is getting paid the same amount or whatever, you still have people in charge of you telling you what to do. I mean, you're still stuck in the mud, like hammering nails into a wall while someone is sitting in an office building just sipping coffee all right so let's talk about that i mean just because you have a guy giving you orders sitting in an office sipping coffee while you are out there doing work that does not imply the same amount of exploitation it doesn't employ any uh, imply any exploitation at all um when you have a boss who is elected by the workers you know let's say that there's a construction project there's a guy marty who's really good at the uh, at doing construction drafting up the blueprints he's a great engineer all the workers vote him to be leader of the construction project just because marty's bossing you around doesn't mean that marty owns the means of production the means of production is still owned collectively by the workers marty is responsible to those workers for the success of the construction project so you know it's the power dynamic between a worker elected boss and a socialist workplace versus a capitalist boss and a capitalist workplace is totally different totally different and it would probably make the most sense to put them and i mean if that's not a satisfactory answer the difference is because the means of production is owned by an individual in the capitalist uh, system whereas in the socialist system the means of production is owned by the collective as the blue dragon puts it most experienced person in charge or maybe put the people who have the best leadership skills in charge either way it means the people in charge would be more highly respected and have a higher social standing than the average peon so i guess my question is how can a society function in an efficient manner without some kind of hierarchy? And even if you value equality over efficiency, what about emergency situations? All right. So, you know, I've know I know I've talked shit about anarchists in the past and in this video a little bit too, but I'm going to give them credit where it's due here. I have never never ever ever heard an anarchist say I want to abolish all hierarchies. Like every single hierarchy out there, even the ones that make total logical sense, I'm just going to abolish them. You know, the only thing I've heard anarchists say is we want to abolish unjust hierarchies. Unjust. So it's like you can argue over whether or not this hierarchy or that hierarchy is just or unjust, needed or unneeded, but... You know, that's a different argument. 
you know, the blue dragon's trying to frame it like there's no hierarchies in this communist society. And that that's not <laughs> that's not realistic, one. And two, it's not reflective on what anarcho-communists actually have to say. And it's certainly not reflective on what communists have to say. So, I mean, you know, th it's just a giant straw man. First responders need someone to organize them and tell them what to do so they can act quickly. They don't have time to sit around and argue and vote about how to put out a fire. I mean, unless you value equality over human life. And at the very, very least, don't you need some... I mean, once again, this this whole thing is just a fabric... Uh, blah, I can't even speak. A fabricated straw man. Like, again, anarchists don't say, let's just abolish all the hierarchies and get rid of all the hierarchies. I mean, I don't want to repeat myself, but this feels like it really needs to be driven home here at this point. Some kind of spokesperson or figurehead to talk to leaders of foreign countries. I mean, unless you plan to have 300 million face cams with everyone all talking at once as a means to communicate with outside countries. I mean, wh what does he think, like, Stalin was? A representative of his country. He, he, he was serving as the general secretary. So, I mean, he had to meet with people. He met, famously, he met with, uh, you know, Roosevelt and Churchill. Uh, I mean, <laughs> pick up a history book. I don't know what to tell you, Catholics. I mean, this, this has happened. In communist systems, people have been delegated as representatives of their country and their government. I mean, this, this has already happened. So the answer to your question is, you know, look, look at the history of communism and see who went to like the UN and gave, gave speeches. Uh, see who who goes to this conference or that conference or this summit or that summit. It's it's the elected leaders of that government. So communism has a problem in that for it to work, everyone in the system needs to want it to work. So my question is, what do you do with the people who don't want it to work? If we use America as an example, 300 million people, and let's be super generous and say that 99% of Americans completely agree that communism is what they wanted, that still leaves three million people that you need to dispose of in some way. And really the only options are either imprison or kill. But not because they did something bad, but just because they didn't think communism was a good idea. Uh, okay. Okay. So, he's asking what to do with basically reactionaries. Do you imprison or kill them? And, you know, as a Leninist, somebody that's read Lenin... Uh, he stresses the need for a vanguard party, one that is constituating of the working class, is the most progressive, revolutionary, dedicated elements of the working class who will ch uh, charge forward and establish a dictatorship of the proletariat. Lenin, you know, understood that vast swaths of the working class are going to be bogged down by capitalist propaganda. They're going to be fed lies by the capitalist-owned media against communism. And so they're going to be largely ignorant of the proletarian revolution and what it could really mean for them. And so the answer is, like, what do we do with these, you know, made-up number three million people that, you know, are, are not on board? Well, we can educate them. We don't, have, <laughs> we don't have to imprison or kill them. That's not the only choices here. We could educate them. And in terms of them being a threat, I don't really think they would be that much of a threat, especially if it was only 1% of the country. And let's just say that those 3 million people, they're all capitalists. They all own the means of production. Well, in the communist revolution, the means of production would be taken away from them. So they would pose no threat anymore. Unless they started using, you know, stockpiles of capital they had invested in, you know, in foreign banks to try to stage a coup or something. But, you know, in that case, yeah, you're talking about imprisonment. But uh, you say in your example that they haven't done anything bad. They just don't agree with you. Well, they're going to be dragged kicking and screaming into the brave new socialist economy, whether they want to or not, because that's how democracy works. If you have a minority of people who don't like the way that the democracy is going, they're, they don't get to uh, exercise their minority will over everybody else. Sorry. You know, that's the very essence of democracy, Catholics. 
I mean, don't take it up with me. Take it up with the Greeks. They're the ones who invented the fucking system. So, is ushering in the communist utopia worth the lives of three million innocent people? And... I mean, once again, this example is fucking wackadoo. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's worth three million people's lives to establish communism, of course. I mean, that it varies. If the country is only three million people, well, then obviously not. But, you know, if you're living in a big, big fucking country where 99% were on board with you and you had this 1% holdout that didn't want communism, well, fuck it. Go forward with the communist revolution. Fuck that 1%. They can, uh, they can get with a fucking program. And if you think that's a hard choice, what if only half of America wanted communism? Which, by the way, is still being very generous. You'd be wiping out 50% of the population. I mean, that's like Thanos levels of insanity. I mean, once again, ignoring the fact that you don't have to fucking resort to killing and imprisoning all these people, you know, you need a, you don't have to have like everybody's consent to go forward with the revolution. That's the point of a vanguard party. You can't wait until 100% of the working class is on your side. Because they never will be. Uh, they're going to, at least certain elements of the working class are going to buy into anti-communist propaganda. So, <laughs> you know, all the more need for a vanguard party over here. But that's just the beginning of it, really. The reason we would have to get rid of these people is because we can't have everyone mooching off the system. I mean, they have to work to aid the collective, and in return they receive food or other resources from the collective. If they don't work, and we still give them the resources that they need, presumably the same amount that you would receive if you did work, then what incentive does anyone have to work? And the system kind of falls apart. Alright, so, I mean, you want to talk about incentives to work under communism. The ANCAPs had a similar question to this. Um, and I'm going to start playing a little uh, thought game with you. Uh, Catholics, anytime you ask one of these questions, ask yourself how these questions work out under a capitalist system. So, what incentive do you have to work under a capitalist system? Well, uh, in capitalism, the workers are forced to sell their labor just to survive, just to make enough money to pay the rent, to pay the bills, and to buy food. Uh, and if you can't do that, well, then you're going to starve, my friend. If you get fired from your job in capitalism, you're going to become homeless. So your incentive to work under capitalism is homelessness, poverty, and starvation. Your incentive uh, to work under communism is obviously going to be a little bit different because your material needs... At least your basic necessities are going to be provided for. You don't have to worry about unemployment. You don't have to worry about uh, a lack of an education, a lack of food, a lack of shelter, a lack of water. Because all of those things will be there for you. So in terms of like incentives, there can be certain luxury commodities still produced that you, know, you might be able to buy with extra wages you earn. But... Uh, there also might be uh, incentives in the form of like extra vacation days or something like that. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a capitalist holding a pink slip over your head, threatening you with poverty and homelessness that incentivizes you to work. Or well, what about people who just aren't good at their job or don't contribute much anyway? What do we do with them? I mean, how do we decide who gets what job in the first place? Do we take aptitude tests? What if there's no opening for the thing we're good at, or if we aren't really good at anything? Alright, so these are sorts of like two questions. So what do we do about the people who don't contribute to society? Again, I ask you, what happens in capitalism to people who don't contribute? Well, they find themselves on welfare. And, you know, I assume when you mean you don't contribute, it means you're, you know, not able-bodied. You're disabled. Uh, either physically or mentally, and you were unable to work. Well, in a capitalist system, you go on welfare, hopefully. Uh, if, you, know, you know, if you live in a country that has a welfare system, 
but you know if not well then you're forced to just die i guess or you know your family has to work extra to try to make up for you but either way your existence isn't something that's guaranteed your house isn't something that's guaranteed your food isn't something that's guaranteed so it's like you either have to work or you starve in a capitalist system uh, the people who don't contribute to the society maybe they can get welfare and live in a capitalist system but in a socialist society it would be ideal if everybody could work but obviously we don't live in an ideal world I mean not everybody is going to be physically able to work and so yeah the state has to be prepared to provide uh, lives and livelihoods for those people who may not be able to produce anything but that doesn't mean their value as human beings is diminished uh, just because you are physically disabled you're not able to to work in a conventional sense that doesn't mean that you deserve to be homeless that doesn't mean that you deserve to die on the street like a dog it doesn't mean that you deserve to be denied basic human dignities like a home like a warm meal uh, fresh clean water you know those kinds of things should be given to everybody no questions asked uh, it's only a capitalist society in which we have the abundance of commodities needed to give everybody everything they need to survive but yet we uh, divvy it up artificially on a market uh, selling it to people who can afford to buy it so you know one, once again you know what about the people who don't contribute well in a socialist society they would be taken care of in a capitalist society their fate is questionable at best like I wanted to be a teacher and maybe I was even good at being a teacher but we didn't need any more teachers we needed farmers and then I had to be a farmer so some people, probably a lot of people, are going to get stuck doing jobs they don't like or aren't good at. Alright. So, I mean, do you not think that that happens in capitalism? Do you not think that in capitalism, most people find themselves working at a job they feel no personal attachment to? They don't get a sense of accomplishment or a sense of fulfillment uh, it's a phenomenon that Marx described as capitalist alienation and I know it's affected me it affects most people uh, most people don't work their dream jobs so I mean the blue dragon by saying oh well in communism you won't get to decide your dream job well first of all that hasn't been established um, consider what life was like and your prospects living as a peasant in czarist Russia compared to living as your average citizen in the USSR I mean your prospects are a lot better in the USSR in the czarist system you were basically illiterate and you were bound to be this sort of feudal peasant living on a farm for your whole life and there's nothing wrong with living and working on farms but in the Soviet system, you had a choice. You could go to the cities. You could be educated. You could learn how to read and write. You could be an engineer if you wanted to. You could be a scientist. Um, your possibilities were expanded greatly. Instead of just being a, a, a slave, a cog in the capitalist machine. Um so yeah I mean that that's pretty much all I have to say about that question and then that's just their life I mean that sucks that combined with the fact that you can't ever get ahead because no matter what you're always gonna get paid the same amount I mean you think you have to... um alright now this is a kind of a confusing question I mean he's saying you're always paid the same in communism so you can never you can never get ahead I don't really know what the blue dragon means by getting ahead in a socialist system uh, <laughs> because I mean you're on the same level as your fellow workers it's there's no like 
private capitalist that's making a killing. You know, the corporate structure is gone. So I, I don't really understand what this person means by getting ahead in a socialist economy. I mean, what do you do? You kiss up to like the party and earn brownie points with them, or something. I mean, that would get you certain like social benefits. Sure, you'd be more popular and everything, but this doesn't like get you on a higher economic rung than anybody else. I have a bad now getting paid minimum wage working at Walmart. Under communism, you'd still be working at Walmart, but now you only get paid in Walmart gift cards. <laughs> Did I seriously just hear that come out of his fucking mouth? Let's hear it one more time, ladies and gentlemen. Always going to get paid the same. Amount. Let's just let this let's just let this sink in. This is a real big-brained argument coming at us. I mean, you think you have it bad now getting paid minimum wage working at Walmart. Under communism, you'd still be working at Walmart, but now you only get paid in Walmart gift cards. Um, do I even need to... I guess I do. I guess I need to explain. Um, dude, Cathorix, Walmart is a fucking capitalist company. In a communist society, there would be no Walmart. All right, there, <laughs> there would be no Walmart. So I don't know what you're trying to say here, my friend. The corporate structure no longer exists. The whole thing makes me think a lot of people would just kind of be inefficient and lazy and maybe purposely screw stuff up in hopes they would get assigned somewhere else. So what do we do with those people? And what will we do with just generally lazy people? All right, so again, I want to sort of flip this question on its head and ask him how does he think this happens in a uh, in a capitalist system in a capitalist system if you're a worker and you're lazy well then you're gonna get fired um, in a socialist system if you're a worker and you're lazy well then you'll probably get a stern talking to by your other fellow workers they'll probably say oh that that guy doesn't pull his own fucking weight uh, you know you might get demoted or something but you're never going to be in a position where you are going to literally be forced with or faced with starvation and homelessness because of your laziness. Um, now, I mean, you go on like workplace sabotage. That's a whole other can of worms right there. I mean, if you're getting into like industrial sabotage, that's like criminal activity. So, yeah, you'd probably go to jail if you did that. But... I mean, you would certainly go to jail if you did that in a capitalist, uh, bleh, in a capitalist system. Uh, I assume you do the exact the exact same thing would happen to you in a socialist system. If you tried to blow the factory up or destroy a machine, you know, you'd probably find yourself facing some legal consequences for that. I mean, to get to this point, you already would have had to imprison and kill millions of dissenters, so probably wouldn't be a problem doing a little bit more of that. I mean, once again, Blue Dragon, this is a fucking mischaracterization and a straw man. Uh, there, There's nothing that says we have to kill millions of people and imprison millions. So, I mean, you know, you're just pulling this out of your Blue Dragon ass. So that raises the question, in this perfect communist society, would making a mistake at work or being lazy mean imprisonment and death? How else would you deal with people? Okay. So, I mean... Once again, I ask him, how does this work in a capitalist system? If you make a mistake at work, you're probably going to get fired. I mean, of course, it depends on the severity of the mistake. Uh, you know, if you blow the whole fucking factory up in a socialist system, you'd probably face prison for that. But, you know, if it was an honest mistake, like a, a spelling error uh, on a document or something... Well, then you'll probably, you might get a stern talking to or something by the Soviet Council, but besides that, you know, you wouldn't be imprisoned. You certainly wouldn't be executed for a minor fucking mistake like that. Uh, you know, I'll have to do some research on Chernobyl, but I'm pretty sure the guy, uh, the nuclear physicists that were, you know, responsible for the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown, you know, I'm pretty sure they didn't get executed for their crimes. Like I said earlier, if you just let them not work, but still paid them, why would anyone work? Uh, okay, let me put it this way. Steve and I are both the same age, gender, we have the same job, same capabilities, and they're nearly identical as far as the collective is concerned. As such, under communism, we should be paid the same amount. 
And when I talk about pay, I'm talking about resources, food, and recreation time, probably, like in Star Trek. But what if someone was getting <laughs> paid more than me, and I didn't think they deserved it? So after work, I'm allotted one hour in the holodeck or whatever, but Steve gets two hours a day in the holodeck because he has stress problems and an extra... Okay, okay, can, can I... Can I just point something out here? If you're going to talk about communism, talk about communism. Don't talk about Star Trek. All right, it's it's the same thing. Like, the, I have a feeling that Cthorix's interpretation as to what communism is comes entirely from his conversations with anarchists and his watching of Star Trek. It would be like if my knowledge of fascism fascism came exclusively from watching the empire from star wars <laughs> you gotta dive a little bit deeper into it than that my friend if you want to truly understand what communism is don't watch star trek read communists extra hour in the holodeck is what the collective has shit man needs. but i know steve pretty well and i'm pretty sure i'm just as stressed as he is i just complain a lot less so why wouldn't I start complaining more or overreacting about how stressed I was just so I could get an extra hour in the holodeck a day too? What would stop everyone from doing that? What's to stop everyone from trying to be diagnosed with every disorder or handicap imaginable in order to get extra pay or special allowances while getting away with doing the least amount of work possible? I mean, people do that already. So one thing that can... Okay, so I mean, once again, I say to the Blue Dragon... Don't people in capitalist societies try to game the system as well? You know, try to claim false disabilities to get checks, welfare checks, that kind of thing. The whole welfare queen myth is basically uh, revolving around this sort of uh, scenario. A person using government welfare institutions to try to get certain benefits when they're not really you know disabled if he thinks that this is a problem in socialism you know it, it's also a problem in capitalism but it's not like it's a uh, you know and because of that it's not a problem that's confined to any one system whenever you have a welfare system you're going to have certain people try to game the system and take control of it and take advantage of it but you know, if anything, that's a fault with the diagnostic methods than anything else. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, an average sample of the population size, you know, per 100 people, only one or two people uh, at the most should get this certain disability. If all of a sudden you have, like, everybody in the workplace reporting that they have, like, multiple sclerosis or something like that, uh, filing for disability... And somehow they are all getting on welfare, getting approved for it. Well, then that's a fault with your diagnostic methods. That's not a fault with communism or anything like that. It's, it's you know, a minor problem that could be just as bad in a capitalist society. That could be just as bad in a, you know, a social democratic society or, you know, in America. So, you know, it, this guy, you know, he thinks that you know welfare queens and stuff like that is going to be a problem in socialism but i mean that's already i don't think it's a problem uh in capitalism but it's cer it's certainly something that is feasible uh you know, i don't think it's nearly as widespread as what the conservatives like to whine uh it is uh but you know keep keeping all that in mind this isn't a problem that is intrinsic to communism. And it's people getting false falsely diagnosed with disabilities. That's the problem lies with the diagnostic method. It doesn't lie with, you know, your kind of government system. What confuses me is how the people who are talking about communism are usually huge advocates for personal freedom. What seems like communism is pretty much the opposite of that. We're talking about every aspect of your life being run by the collective. You want to be a teacher? <laughs> Too bad. We need farmers. You want to eat bread? Too bad. You get a potato. All right. So, I mean, once again, this guy is doing a complete mess misrepresentation and a straw man of socialism. 
and I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt and I'm assuming that these are honest questions that Cthorix is asking these questions because he honestly doesn't know he honestly wants to somebody to give him an answer he's not just out here to try to do a snarky little gotcha attack like what a lot of those anarchist uh, ANCAPs were trying to do but you know when he says communism is every aspect of your life being run by the collective oh okay so in the USSR did you have to wake up every morning and ask the fucking uh, you know central Soviet if you could take a piss yeah, <laughs> uh, every, every morning I wake up and uh, I have to ask the collective, do I eat Cheerios or do I eat Fruit Loops this morning? You know, <laughs> every single aspect, every little last mundane uh, action has to be decided by the collective. It's almost like your game uh, or your life is a version of the game Twitch plays Pokemon where thousands of people are controlling you all at once. You know, th that's kind of what the blue dragon thinks socialism is or communism is, but it, it's not. It's this is just a complete misrepresentation. I don't know if it's deliberate, but, you know, I am choosing to believe that it is not deliberate, that this person is just genuinely ignorant about socialism. And there's nothing wrong with asking questions. If you really don't know uh, and, and you really want to find out the answers to these questions, there's nothing wrong with asking the questions. Um, you know, I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody uh, who has questions about these uh, these kinds of things. What if the collective votes on some policy that doesn't really seem to be all that politically correct? Like, what if they said you're not allowed to be gay? Do you fight the collective, or you just accept that homophobia is going to be a thing in order for the communist utopia to function? Okay, so so once again, I don't think this person has really thought through what it means to be on the far left. You know, you advocate for egalitarianism, an end to racism, to male chauvinism, uh, LGBTQ rights, that kind of thing. I mean, I haven't found any communist in 2019 going around saying we should hate gay people and be against gay marriage you know that usually comes from the conservatives it usually comes from people of Cthorix's political persuasion so it's kind of strange uh, to see Cthorix cook up this hypothetical scenario in which communists are banning gay marriage now historically you can look historically uh, there have been some uh, anti-gay laws and stuff in the USSR um, but you can consider those to be products of the time and when you consider how revolutionary and how progressive the Soviet government was compared to literally all the other governments on earth yeah it's it's easy to see that if they were still around nowadays they would be leading the charge of LGBTQ rights uh, just as they led the charge in their own day uh, for the rights of women, ethnic and cultural minorities, etc. Come to think of it, I'm very sure that any sort of multiculturalism would be mm -hmm. suppressed too. Everyone is equal and everyone is the same. It seems like it would be deemed a threat to communism to celebrate your individuality or how different your culture is from everyone else's. Um, yeah, uh, just look at the USSR. That's all I have to say. I mean... I, I don't want to make fun of you, Cthorix, but to say that communism suppresses multiculturalism is one of the most ignorant things I think I've ever fucking heard my whole life. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really almost at a loss for words because it's like, on one hand, I don't want to believe that there's somebody out there like Cthorix, a fucking conservative furry that goes around talking about why we need child cyborg workers and and just giving these really bad questions about communism but i mean i can't argue with it. it's right here in front of my fucking face i mean this dude's this dude i assume is real um 
and his questions seem like they're at least somewhat genuine so I mean I'm, I'm trying my best to answer them but I mean at the same time you know you got to take a, a step back and just be like Jesus fucking Christ you know where did this guy come from where did you come from dude <laughs> anyway at the very least religion would have to go as it's probably the single most divisive issue in human society okay so that's sort of a misunderstanding once again about communism you know that Karl Marx said religion is the opiate of the masses and he was right in that organized religion can teach the working class to sort of abandon their lot in this life and to just or to accept their lot in this life and ex and abandon the concept of trying to improve one's lot in life saying don't really live for this world live for the next world live for heaven uh and in order to live for heaven you must suffer here on earth so don't try to challenge the capitalist system uh don't try to challenge the monarchist system so in many ways organized religion serves as a reactionary element to reinforce the capitalist structure and you can see under you know the czarist regime in russia that the Russian Orthodox Church was tied intrinsically in to Tsarist power. So, in a way to sort of ensure that the political enshrinement of the Tsar no longer remained, it became evident that the Soviets needed to get rid of the Russian Orthodox Church, needed to definitely limit their scope and their political influence as much as possible. And this doesn't mean that in the USSR people weren't free to be religious. This doesn't mean that everybody was an atheist. It just means that all the schools weren't being run by religious institutions anymore. The government didn't officially endorse one religion over the other. There was secularization. And there was a policy of state atheism and this was essentially to ensure that no organized religion served as sort of an organ to prop up reactionary forces but you know th there was nothing that was like let's round up all the christians and kill them because they're christians because if if the russians decided to do that they'd be rounding up a vast majority of their population so my question is I but I I mean, you can look at like the Mongolian SSR. They had tons and tons of Buddhists. Uh, you can look at like the uh, uh, Soviet Socialist Republics, you know, closer to the Middle East, uh, places like uh, modern day Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan. They have a lot of Muslims living there. So, I mean, obviously, Russia was a multi religious, multi ethnic, multicultural society that didn't change. When the Soviets came into power, the only thing that changed was the political enshrinement of the Russian Orthodox Church. Are you willing to tell all Muslims in your communist utopia that they aren't allowed to practice their religion anymore? No. No, I'm not willing. Because that that's a human right. You can practice whatever religion you want. As long as, you know, you and, and your fellow religious followers aren't trying to undermine or destroy the revolution then yeah you do you dog now this is my last question but probably the most simple one do you believe that every other person in the country or even most people or maybe just a good number of people outside your immediate friends and family have your best interest in mind or care about you at all or even know what your best interests are and do you trust that they're going to act on your best interests instead of their own all right, so this this question to me is one of the most hilarious because it's like, oh, you wouldn't trust the collective to look out for your individual interests. Okay, well then would you trust the individual to look out for collective interests? I mean, are you advocating for a sort of monarchism or, or fascism where you have one big strong man who calls the shots for everybody? Because that seems to be kind of what you're implying. In a democracy, the popular will of the collective is what's followed by the society. 
and you as an individual if you don't want to go forward with a certain you know uh, with a certain kind of societal trajectory well then there's very little you can do as an individual to prevent that that's the same in this society and that's the same for a Soviet society or, or, or a socialist society I mean <laughs> this guy is like why trust the collective to try to meet your individual needs well what what other option is there buckaroni i mean you trust private individuals to look out for your needs that's you know that's sort of like the capitalist system here so you know in a capitalist system you have one person who controls the means of production calling you know pretty much all the shots and you know you as a worker have no say the collective has no say the individual has all the say if you know if we define the individual as being the capitalist so I mean in a society where the collective is making decisions on behalf of the collective wouldn't that be much more beneficial to society as a whole than a single individual making decisions on behalf of the collective I don't know maybe it's just a difference of how we think I mean after all this is a guy who wants children to be turned into child uh, cyborg workers uh, to work in factories so I mean you know obviously we have differences on how we think the economy should work <laughs> I, <laughs> I think I think that the working class sh should control the means of production this guy thinks that children should turn into cyborgs and work in a capitalist uh, hellscape I mean potato potato but I hope that you know this guy actually sees this video cathorics you I hope you see this video I hope I've answered some of your questions I tried to answer them as best I could uh, you know and and I tried to do it from a non-judgmental standpoint I know some of the questions you asked were you know, pretty fucking stupid but you know that that's just my humble opinion but uh, I tried to take you seriously, um, and yeah, uh, <laughs> happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Uh, Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, happy Thanksgiving, Cathorix. Maybe, you know, go rub your magical crystals and put that cool helmet on and, and make some more videos about child cyborg soldiers, because that was entertaining as fuck. Uh, so anyway, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Peace out.